So good morning. Uh, this is a uh, webinar presentation from the Center for Future Consciousness. Whoop. Little technical glitch there for a second. Uh, the 1990s, the farthest reaches of space, time, and mind. How to explain, how to describe, even the omniscient viewpoint quails, Venor Vinci. Uh, that's the opening line of uh, Vinci's uh, 1990s uh, classic science fiction novel, A Fire Upon the Deep. And uh, I thought it was an appropriate quote to put at the beginning of uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, I've subtitled this webinar, The Farthest Reaches of Space, Time, and Mind, because it seems to me as a reader of science fiction that the 1990s was a very significant, distinctive period in the evolution of science fiction, because during that time, writers went out to indeed the farthest reaches of the universe and beyond, and beyond, the farthest reaches of time to the end of the universe and even beyond, and explore the limits and possibilities of mind and consciousness as never before. That is, during this period, science fiction philosophically and cosmically expanded outward uh, to um, vistas and perspectives that were immense in scope and depth. Uh, one could say that during this period, uh, science fiction uh, more than ever before got into not only the uh, development or building of worlds of realities, but the building and development of multiple universes and cosmos. Um, I find it uh, uh, interesting that when I went and looked at my list of my own favorite science fiction novels that Terry had referred to, uh, seven of the top 25 novels that I list as my favorites were from this 10 year period. Uh, uh, the, the depth and intricacy and literal size of science fiction novels uh, expanded to of course uh, assimilate, give space enough for the scope uh, I think that this is a, a, a period where if you are a futurist and interested in the future of the earth, the solar system, the universe as a whole, if you are a cosmologist or philosopher and are interested in the nature of reality, if you are a, um, uh, someone interested in uh, mind and consciousness, and are uh, fascinated with <clears throat> the ways in which the mind or consciousness could expand through our through human imagination. In all those cases, this is a, definitely an appropriate webinar, an appropriate period of time uh, to get into and think about. And uh, uh, Venor Vinci's quote there kind of sums it up. Um, if one wants to blow one's mind or boggles one's mind in reading science fiction and quail in the sense of be taken aback in apprehension, intellectual uh, shock over what the human mind can concoct on paper, this is a period to read. Um, and I'm gonna talk about um, a number of the significant authors and significant uh, novels of this period. Now, this webinar, which is webinar 16 in the series, is, as Terry had mentioned, and, and you've come to a lot of them, many of you, is part of a series I've been doing 
based upon uh, my uh, ongoing uh, developing uh, history of science fiction, the evolutionary mythology of the future. And uh, in the webinars, we've already gone through volume one, Prometheus to the Martians, volume two, the time machine to Metropolis, Volume three, Superman to Star Maker. Uh, we did uh, what will be volume four, the Golden Age through the Silver Age. We've done volume five, although it hasn't been written up yet, but we've done the webinars on it, the New Wave, Star Wars, and Cyberpunk. And today we're beginning what will be the final volume in the series, Hyperion, The Singularity, and Beyond and volume six will cover the 1990s up through the present. So again, uh, we've been through uh, five of these novels, uh, five of these uh, books, not novels already, and now we're starting into volume six, the last 30 years of science fiction. And as I mentioned, um, uh, this webinar series is from the Center for Future Consciousness, and I'm Tom Lombardo, the director of the Center for Future Consciousness. And I should mention that our mission is to advance the purposeful evolution of humanity through the heightening of future consciousness and wisdom and the inspirational mythic and cosmic power of science fiction. And uh, the Center for Future Consciousness uh, publishes a newsletter, Future Consciousness Insights, and as Terry mentioned, uh, we have a video school where all of the previous webinars are recorded and up there for your viewing, uh, up through the last one we did on cyberpunk. Um, here are the books that I've uh, uh, published and written on um, uh, psychology, philosophy, the future, science fiction. And since I did the last webinar, actually published a new one, Essays on the Future of Psychology and Consciousness. Uh, so all of these books are available through Amazon. And in particular, if you're interested in science fiction, the three science fiction books are up there, the ones that have been published already. So, Last time, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the webinar dealt with the uh, late 1970s through cyberpunk, which ran up through the uh, uh, end of the 1980s. That's what I covered during that time, how science fiction conquered the world. And uh, I just want to just for those people who didn't attend it, just give you a quick review about what we talked about last time. Uh, actually, it was, uh, we did two webinars on this. Uh, talked about Thomas Dish's idea that science fiction has conquered the modern world insofar as science fiction and its images and ideas have permeated out through the modern world and a particular way in which science fiction has permeated out into uh, informing and inspiring the modern world is through science fiction cinema, uh, the development of science fiction spectacularism, the commercialization of science fiction in the cinema uh, with Star Wars, Close Encounters, Star Trek, and many, many other uh, popular movies that emerged in the 1970s and into the 80s, and the creation of subcultures. Uh, uh, science fiction TV, I talked about that a little bit, talked about the continuing evolution of the science fiction community and uh, the uh, proliferation of more awards given out. I highlighted Isaac Asimov's editing of the Hugo Award winners. We talked about those. And it was during this period of the 70s and 80s that the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, which is a great resource for anybody interested in science fiction, emerged, uh, edited by uh, Nicole Zinclute. Um, some of the key writers I talked about were uh, uh, Brian Aldiss with his Hot House of Future Earth, uh, his contributions into the new wave science fiction history, and it's his three volume uh, trilogy on Heliconia. And I should just mention as I go along now that science fiction novels got bigger and bigger as the decades went by. Some of the early examples in, back from the 1980s were Heliconia, 
uh, which was a world building alien uh, civilization vision that all this did. David Brin, who's the next one down on the list, who is a uh, futurist as well as a science fiction writer, uh, wrote uh, toward the tail end of the 1980s, uh, the uh, novel Earth, which is an excellent ecological uh, uh, world building vision of uh, the near future on the earth. Uh, another very popular writer during the 80s was Orson Scott Card with his Ender series, which you could see as a world building vision as well. John Varley's Gaian trilogy, which was fascinating. I don't know if I'd call it world building, but it definitely was a very fascinating and popular three volume uh, work on a uh, alien uh, intelligence. And, uh, Douglas Adams, who talked about, is very extremely uh, well, uh, uh, popular and big-selling uh, Life, the Universe, and Everything, uh, five or six volumes of that. One of the most mammoth productions in science fiction and fantasy was Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. Uh, talked about a number of women science fiction writers, Vonda McIntyre, Joan Vinge, with Snow Queen, Margaret Atwood, with Handmaid's Tale, and uh, Sherry and her um, uh, side team and Down Below Station, Hugo winning novels. Then I spent some time talking about how uh, technology transformed during the 70s and 80s with the uh, spread of the computer, with the beginnings of the web and the internet, and how that would have an impact upon both popular culture as well as on science fiction and in particular how it impacted and uh, stimulated the emergence of cyberpunk and the idea of cyberspace. We'll talk a little bit more about that even today. Uh, uh, cyberpunk actually created a new vision of the future and indeed created a new metaphysical vision of reality with the introduction of virtual reality. Uh, and I talked about some of the key uh, cyberpunk writers like Gibson and Sterling and Rudy Rucker. Uh, Rudy Rucker uh, and Gibson both were uh, uh, very um, uh, uh, proficient at creating intricate future uh, realities. Uh, and I uh, ended the uh, webinar with Neil Stevenson and his two very famous novels, Snow Crash and The Diamond Age. The Diamond Age was actually written in the 1990s and is one of the seven novels of the 90s that I list as uh, among my top favorite 25. Um, uh, the Diamond Age indeed is a very intricate and rich vision of the near future on the earth. And uh, that's, that, as I said, was done during the 1990s, but I decided to put it together with Snow Crash because those are his first two uh, significant uh, novels more will be said about Neil Stevenson when I come up into the um, 21st century, because Stevenson, as well as Gibson, for example, continued to write popular science fiction novels, and I'll talk more about them in subsequent um, uh, webinars. But when I finished up last time, uh, I didn't get through everything in module 15. And one of the features of cyberpunk is that cyberpunk as a culture creates a new visualization of human reality in the future. That is, what emerges in the 1980s with cyberpunk is not just simply a philosophy, not just simply novels, but uh, an evolution in science fiction art. And what I didn't get to last time was I didn't get to uh, doing a quick uh, review of how science fiction art evolved during the 1970s and 80s. And so for just about five minutes, we're going to have a little bonus here uh, before going into the 90s uh, uh, regarding great science fiction artists of the 70s and 80s, and in particular, looking at science fiction art. Um, this is one of my uh, more favorite uh, paintings and artists of the 1970s uh, and 80s, uh, Patrick Woodruff. And um, it's a, a combination of surrealism and of uh, a kind of metaphysical 
and uh, spacey vision of um, uh, his uh, conscious perspective on, uh, on art and combining together fantasy as well as a kind of mysticism in it too. But it's a very eye-catching image that he put together uh, as part of his work during the 1970s and 80s. I'll show you some more of Patrick Woodruff in a moment. Uh, one key artist of the period, Sword and Sorcery, did all of the new images for the Edgar Rice Burroughs novels when they were re-released back in the 70s and 80s, was Frank Frasetta. And Frank Frasetta was a very influential science fiction fantasy artist during that time. And uh, Frasetta was very visceral, uh, very um, uh, uh, colorful, uh, uh, lots of intense emotionality, mixing together humans and aliens and other strange creatures. And Frasetta was uh, one of the uh, uh, science fiction artists who has been elected to the um, uh, Science Fiction Hall of Fame. And Frasetta is, uh, uh, was the first grand master of uh, the uh, Spectrum Awards for Science Fiction Art when it was given out the first year. So Frank Frasetta was a definitely big name during the period uh, flourishing in the 1970s and 80s um, and um, uh, actually living to 2010. Here's Patrick Woodruff, who was a bit different in lots of ways and flourished in the 70s and 80s and combined together fantasy, surrealism, science fiction, and very bizarre collage-like uh, uh, imagery. imagery. Um, uh, there is his cover for Abraham Mer uh, Meredith's re-release, Merit, re-release of Burn Witch Burn and I Am a Teacup and for one of Terry Carr's uh, covers from uh, Universe. Uh, Patrick Woodruff really enjoyed, I liked him a lot back in the 1970s and 80s, got a few of his books and actually made a collage out of Patrick Woodruff's stuff. Um, another, that was another significant artist. Gilbert Williams, who was more mystical, cosmic, kind of a Sedona science fiction artist, was very popular, continues to be so combining aliens and uh, the cosmos with um, uh, 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 figures that border on fantasy and almost deity, like there's angel of the threshold. They're very luminant, filled with a lot of light, uh, a different kind of artist, but very popular 70s, 80s, even up to the present. He's still alive. Um, for space art, out of space art, John Ber Berkey uh, was very popular during that time, did art for Star Wars, did art for the republication of Doc Smith's space operas, uh, the Lensman series. Um, and uh, uh, Berkey uh, uh, developed a very um, dynamical uh, uh, outer space space opera type of art, as you can see by looking at it. Um, Building on Frank Frasetta, Boris Vallejo and his wife, Julie Bell, went even further in uh, erotic, visceral, colorful, flamboyant uh, fantasy science fiction art. Um, Vallejo became a popular artist in, in pop culture beyond fantasy and science fiction. And uh, his art has, uh, uh, is easily found you know, in bookstores or on the web. Now, a fascinating thing about Vallejo is that if you look down in the middle there of the woman with the butterfly wings holding an image of herself in a bubble, that's his wife as the model, Julie Bell. And Julie Bell became an artist of her own. And the four images on the uh, on the uh, right side of this uh, slide are by Julie Bell. So Julie Bell was first of all his model, but became an artist along with him. And the two of them created a very uh, um, uh, dynamical and erotic uh, fantasy and science fiction art, which became very popular. 
But the one who is probably the most inventive and well-respected of the science fiction artists of these two decades, and I think he was the most imaginative and creative, although he was gruesome as hell, was H.R. Uh, Geiger, or Giger, however you pronounce his name. And uh, Giger, or Geiger, is the artist who created the original image for Alien. And, uh, and, and if I recall correctly, the one I have up there of uh, the image of Alien was the original painting that he did. Um, and Geiger is interesting in that he combines the mechanical and the technological with the biological and makes it erotic in a kind of perverse way. He also seems to be an artist, and you may see this in him too, who gets into death as, and uh, gets into the macabre. Uh, but there was nobody else like him. He was very, very um, uh, unique in his artwork there's a great video, if you'd like to watch it, that's on Amazon uh, with when he was still alive, uh, uh, interviewing him and going through his house and looking at his artwork. And I highly recommend to get a feeling for the man that you uh, watch that uh, video. It's a very fascinating video. Uh, Geiger, in fact, actually did uh, drawings, the one down on the left bottom side for the never produced um, massive doom that was going to come out in the 1970s and 80s and never did. Um, but uh, Geiger uh, was a, um, uh, a grandmaster from Spectrum Art Awards, and he's also was elected to the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, too. And um, he was the most unique. Now, uh, in, in my mind, at least. And as I mentioned, he combined and attempted to synthesize biological and fleshy kinds of realities with technological mechanistic realities. And in a certain kind of way that is representative of cyberpunk imagery, where we take flesh bodies and we take machines and computers and we try to fuse them into one. Uh, the emergence of the cyborg as an art form, an art vision. And so as a final slide on the art of this period, here's just a sampling of cyberpunk art. Some of these I've gotten, some of these images from top 50 cyberpunk art of all time. <coughs> But cyberpunk art uh, creates uh, 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 visions of a future reality in which uh, technology, uh, at least computer technology, has evolved. Computer technology is integrated with, uh, with humans and with everything around us. And we live in a computerized reality and computerized flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's some cyberpunk uh, art, just so you get a flavor of it. Sometimes it's fantastical, often it's bright with neon colors, and often it's dark and moody, because of course novels like Neuromancer uh, were very dark and moody in ways. And here's a few more examples of cyberpunk art. Uh, so, well, um, uh, science fiction was evolving, science fiction art was evolving too. And what we see by the end of the 1980s going into the 90s, we get this new kind of art that's emerging, uh, cyberpunk art. Now, today, uh, well, actually not today, but in this webinar, the 1990s, we're going to see another wave of inventiveness in science fiction art that's connected with a science fiction movement. Like cyberpunk was a science fiction movement of the 80s. In the 90s, we see the emergence of steampunk. And steampunk is a subculture within science fiction as much as cyberpunk was. And steampunk develops its own uh, type of artistic expression as well too. 
this brings me back to a point I've made before is that science fiction is a multifaceted type of holistic consciousness. It's the literature, it's the cinema, it's the art, it's the communities, it's the overall way of life that comes along with it. And so steampunk is gonna become a new way of life, a new kind of visualization. And in this case here, in fact, steampunk will be a visualization of an alternative or, or alternate reality from our own. Cyberpunk is a vision of a future reality. Steampunk will be a vision of an alternate reality. So that sort of just takes us through the, um, uh, that little piece that I left out last time about uh, science fiction art and how it developed during the 1970s and 80s. Now we'll turn directly to the 90s. Uh, and this is going to be part one today of the 90s. And in part one, I'm going to talk about seven authors. That's going to be it. Um, and the seven authors that I'm going to talk about and their uh, uh, science fiction uh, novels are Dan Simmons, Venor Vinge, Greg Bear, Kim Stanley Robinson, Michael Bishop, Greg Egan, and we'll finish up with Stephen Baxter. And as we move down through this list of these seven significant novelists of the 1990s, we're going to see how they participate in the creation of these intricate, immense uh, literary visions of future realities, future Earths, histories of the universe, histories of alternative universes, and they become increasingly, as we go down the list, except I have Michael Bishop in there, this is going to be a special little case, they become increasingly cosmic and mind-bending and mind-boggling by the time we come down to Greg Egan and Stephen Baxter at the end. But I'm highlighting these seven because these seven all wrote extremely significant science fiction novels or series during this period of time. Um, and I'm going to start with Dan Simmons. Whoop. Now, here is the Shrike, for which Dan Simmons is very famous. Now, some of you may have read one or more of the uh, four-volume series of the Hyperion Cantos. Uh, these were written over a 10-year period, actually beginning in 1989 with Hyperion and running up through the rise of Endymion in uh, 1999, I think, over a 10-year period. And um, uh, the most famous character or figure in this four-volume series is the Shrike. And the Shrike is this enigmatic, mysterious, uh, nine-foot-tall, being from the future who is both a killer and a savior at the same time. Hyperion begins roughly around the year 2800 AD. And in 2800 AD, humanity has spread out to the stars. And in fact, in the process before spreading out to the stars, actually destroys the earth. Uh, and we'll come back to that. And uh, the, uh, the saga runs for approximately 300 years in the history of humanity from 2800 to about 3100 AD. Now, what I put up there for uh, a subtitle here is uh, the Hyperion epic, the future of everything. And when I encounter people who will say that um, uh, uh, a science fiction is a, a juvenile, that science fiction um, is not literary, uh, that science fiction uh, doesn't stimulate one's intellect. 
I will tell them, well, you should sit down and read volume one of the Hyperion series, because all those stereotypes of science fiction are totally contradicted in, that, in the first novel, Hyperion. Hyperion, the first novel in the series, is modeled on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and involves seven stories written by seven pilgrims who are traveling to the planet Hyperion to confront the Shrike who lives on that planet, had appeared on that planet out of a time tomb, which is running backwards in time and murdering people by the thousands on the planet, but is being worshiped by this nefarious church of pain as the Lord of pain. And he is part of this prophecy that will bring the downfall, presumably going to bring the downfall of humanity. Dan Simmons was an English literature writer, and Hyperion is modeled on a classic of English literature. And it is a extremely rich and imaginative vision of reality in the 28th century with an incredible variety of interesting characters and extremely visceral, but it presents this vision of the future of humanity in the year 2800 that involves the science and technology, faster than light travel, for example, and computers that humans don't even understand anymore, but it involves religion, it involves themes about immortality, it involves themes about um, uh, uh, the significance of uh, uh, the Catholic Church and of pain and suffering. Uh, the philosophy of T.R. D. Chardin is worked into the, into the saga as well, too. That is, the whole series turns into a vision of the future of everything. And Simmons' imaginative literary style is without question, a real jump forward in the kind of richness of books that anybody had written, just in, in science fiction. Uh, and just in case you weren't aware of it, Simmons actually wrote a short novella, Helix, which was a follow-up to these four of that uh, I've mentioned up here, which are part of the, the main series, the Hyperion series. Now, just to give you a little more imagery, um, this is one person's vision of the tree ship, which the seven pilgrims travel on from the, uh, uh, their various other locations to the uh, planet Hyperion. Here are the seven pilgrims who involve a Templar, a poet, a philosopher, a warrior, a consul, a private detective, and a priest. And each of them tells their story as part of the saga of Hyperion. <clears throat> and here's some other imagery that goes along with the uh, first volume in particular. Um, on the left-hand side there, one of the key features in Hyperion, the first novel, is that on the planet Hyperion are these beings, the, the, the Bikaru, Bikaru, Bikara, who are given immortality by the Shrike by having a cruciform imprinted on their chest but every time they are brought back to life, and that's how they have immortality, they become more imbecilic. The priest tells the story of the Bikaru and tells the story about another priest who gets crucified on this cross that you see up here in the imagery. And this cross that presumably is connected with the shrike becomes a central archetype in the story. The time tombs are up here too, the whole series of time tombs that came back from the future. 
the technology of faster than light travel, the forecasters, which is an image that's up here on the screen too, and the ousters, who are a separate group of humans who have adapted to outer space and are in a war with the civilization of the earth, not the earth, the civilization of humanity in the 28th century. A very curious thing about the end of volume one is that volume one ends with the seven characters walking up to meet the Shrike at the end, somewhat reminiscent of the ending in the wizard, not the ending, but the scene in the Wizard of Oz where the characters are going to meet the Wizard of Oz. <clears throat> So Hyperion attempts to weave together lots of different elements about the future in this literally theologically infused story and creates these individual characters who have different stories to tell. Like for example, up here, the philosopher scholar notice has a baby strapped around his shoulders and that baby, who is his daughter, is actually a being who is getting younger and younger through time. And he's going to meet the Shrike, hoping that the Shrike can turn the temporal sequence of the baby's aging around. Um, so there's stories within stories um, in um, uh, the first volume of Hyperion. Um, the... Uh, Human civilization, by the end of the second vine, the fall of Hyperion, collapses. Although, in the meantime, you get a very intricate picture uh, leading up to that. And part of that intricate picture involves the detective having a love affair with the reincarnation of the poet John Keats and having a baby on, on, on a recreated Earth after the first Earth has been destroyed. When we come to volumes three and four, the baby who has been born by the detective Ania is seen as a great threat to of all things to take control of human civilization, the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church has popes who are the same person over and over again, continually being resurrected from the dead originally the priest from volume one, and Aenea now is a target for the Catholic Church being chased in a faster-than-light ship with the captain, who is a Catholic priest, but being protected by the strike. The character in the middle, Raoul Endymion, falls in love with Aenea, which and he is also her protector, and the Shrike has to do battle with a being that has been created by artificial intelligence in the Catholic Church, who is even uh, in ways meaner than the Shrike, Nemesis on the right there, Nemesis. And the Shrike and Nemesis do battle, and they are able to jump through space and time. They move so fast you can't see them. There's a picture up there of John Keats, who is in fact reincarnated in the father of Aenea. Uh, there's a great debate in the rise of Endymion between the Grand Inquisitor and a Dalai Lama. Raoul and um, Aenea become lovers on a Buddhist planet. <clears throat> and at the end, of the four volume saga, we have a uh, second coming, who is Aenea, that involves a resurrection that requires time travel. And, and the whole saga ends with humanity moving out further into the cosmos to uh, uh, facilitate evolution further uh, uh, of conscious minds. So this whole thing is a real trip. The Hyperion series is a real trip. Some of you may have read it. Some of you may have read part of it. But when I read it 
when I first read it, I thought, this is a real qualitative jump in the literary dimensions of science fiction, the imagination of science fiction, and uh, uh, Dan Simmons' capacity to weave together the future of everything into one four volume, what is it, like 2000 page epic um, with this religious, spiritual overtone to the whole thing. Dan Simmons does a great job in envisioning the Catholic Church a thousand years from now. Really great job in doing that. <clears throat> After he finished this, and before I come to the next uh, novels he wrote, which I'm, I'm going to mention in a moment, I met Dan Simmons. He came to Phoenix, and um, I got into a debate with him about whether humans have, been made, had, the, have had the idea of progress for two or 300 years or for 2,000 years. But it was an interesting encounter with him. So I have all four volumes of his <clears throat> Hyperion series signed by him. And when he came to Phoenix, he was mentioning and he had a new book that was coming out so soon in the future. And this takes us a little bit into the um, uh, 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 new millennium, but I wanna include it here because after Simmons did these next two books, he just literally disappeared from science fiction and write anymore. But after he did the Hyperion series, <clears throat> he did something very fascinating. But uh, and that's not saying Hyperion wasn't fascinating. What he did was he wrote a two volume um, epic that are titled, that is titled Ilium and Olympus. And Ilium starts in what appears to be a total down to the finest detail, recreation of the siege of Troy by the ancient Greeks. And all of the characters from Homer's Iliad are there battling the Trojans. But the whole thing is happening on the surface of the planet Mars sometime in the distant future. And there's a character from our time who has somehow been brought back to life, who has been assigned to observe the events during the siege and compare them with the original <clears throat> story by Homer to see if there's any discrepancies emerging between this version of the siege of Troy and the way it was depicted in the Iliad. Now, what Simmons does in here for students of consciousness, and I mentioned here uh, that in reference to, uh, I know Leslie's there and Alan's there, who both and maybe other people are interested in the theme of consciousness, is his description of the conscious minds of the Greeks and the Trojans are different than the way we would describe our modern conscious minds in that they behave and think as if they are talking and performing before an audience. That is, they have what Julian James referred to as <clears throat> bicameral minds without a sense of integrated ego, but rather a sense of living through the approval and interaction with their deities and gods. They are um, hallucinatory consciousnesses, except in this case here, the Greek gods and goddesses appear to be real, which is where the question comes in as to how indeed this vision that he's creating here could possibly have occurred. So we're on a mystery. The mystery is why is the siege of Troy happening again 2,000, 3,000 years in the future? What is going on with this whole thing? And, this, and the uh, person from the present, the historian, who has been sent into the future somehow to observe the thing, gets infatuated with Helen and disrupts the whole story. And by the time we get through this, 
we not only delve into a science fiction retelling of the Iliad, but we have a science fiction retelling of Shakespeare's The Tempest in Olympus, where we have Prospero and Calabad who were in uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest <clears throat> coming back in science fiction form here. here. So Simmons synthesizes together in these two novels, some of our classic myths <clears throat> with contemporary science fiction and retells them. Eventually you do figure out what's going on here on Mars, who these Greek gods and goddesses really are. Are they really Zeus and, uh, uh, and um, <clears throat> the, the rest of the whole Parthenon of gods? Um, or, or are they something else? And robots got to get into the picture too, which they will as, as, as the uh, stories move along. So <clears throat> they're not as good as the Hyperion series, but they definitely bring up this notion, which I've talked about before, that science fiction is the mythology of the future. And indeed, in this case here, uh, we have somebody who's actually taking ancient myths and retelling them again in science fiction form. Now, <clears throat> the second author I'm going to talk about for a bit here is Venor Vinci. And Venor Vinci is famous for lots of different reasons. And Venor Vinci stayed with science fiction for a lot longer than Dan Simmons did. <clears throat> Indeed, Early on, and this goes now back into the 1980s, Venor Vinci uh, wrote a novella, True Names, and two science fiction novels, The Peace War and Marooned in Time, where he originally uh, got uh, uh, attention, uh, uh, significant attention in the science fiction community, uh, in particular because in True Names, he appears to have been the science fiction writer who invented the concept of cyberspace, which becomes a significant element in um, cyberpunk, which doesn't really come along for a little bit longer after that, uh, where we have a bunch of computer hackers who, have, who uh, exist in a virtual reality and have as their main uh, a source of uh, their main adversary, the U.S. government, and um, and exist incognito in in this envisioned cyberspace, and there is some kind of strange uh, AI who is taking over all of the computer systems across the globe. And these characters have been enlisted by the US government to somehow defeat whatever this strange uh, AI is that is assimilating everything. Um, and, um, uh, and, and true names um, uh, uh, made Vinci uh, uh, famous you know, early on in the 1980s. Vinji was a computer scientist, a professor in computer science, in fact. Like where Simmons had been a teacher in English literature, Vinji was a, a, a professor in computer science. Marooned in Real Time and the Peace War are interesting novels on time travel, which came out a little bit later, back in the 1980s as well, too. But where Vinji really came into his own was in the 1990s, because in 92, he published a nonfiction uh, paper called The Coming Technological Singularity. And that paper is usually taken as being the classic reference for discussions up through the present on what is the technological singularity, when will computers indeed exceed humans in intelligence, and what will be the consequences of that. And Vinci wrote that around 92, although I think the ideas have been circulating around in his mind, he'd been written, writing about it even before that. But uh, Vinci was not only turned into an accomplished science fiction writer, he was an accomplished theoretical scientist and computer scientist as well. 
And as we'll see, the technological singularity over the last 20, 30 years, especially, has been a very important theme within science fiction. Computers that are smarter than humans. We saw it in Hyperion, and we'll see it again and again and again. And what are going to be the consequences of that? What happens to humanity? <clears throat> but where he really came into his own as a science fiction writer were two novels in the 90s, A Fire Upon the Deep and A Deepness in the Sky. And just like Hyperion is one of my 25 favorites science fiction novels, so is A Fire Upon the Deep. And in fact, The Fire Upon the Deep is in some ways more imaginative than Hyperion. A Fire Upon the Deep takes place tens of thousands of years in the future. Humanity is still around. The setting is the Milky Way. A bunch of humans are out on the border of the Milky Way and discover this um, uh, artificial intelligence that promises great riches if they activate it. And they do, and this artificial intelligence is um, uh, fundamentally um, out to assimilate and to conquer and uh, reconfigure from there on in the entire Milky Way in accordance with its own intellect and purposes. So humanity lets loose on the Milky Way, in essence, a computer virus which is going to destroy the Milky Way. So we have this galactic catastrophe going on. We have a galactic internet where aliens from across the, across the galaxy are communicating with each other as fast as they can, commenting on the fact that their whole galactic civilization is falling apart and realizing that it's humans who have accidentally let this beast, this perversion loose and wondering what to do to prop, how they're gonna save the Milky Way. The humans send one, two ships off before they are assimilated by the perversion. Those two ships, one gets destroyed, but the other lands on a world where the dominant life form on that world are beings that have a medieval mentality and are like dogs or wolves and live as packs, whereby it's only a group of four or five times, that's what they're called, together, who have a sense of personal identity and singular consciousness. So we have a singular consciousness embodied in a multiplicity of bodies. The way they achieve that singular consciousness is they have membranes on their body which resonate and vibrate with each other, <clears throat> creating a kind of gestalt vibratory field, which is the energetic embodiment of their consciousness. And so this is a very inventive kind of alien. And remember, keep in mind that they have medieval motives and a medieval way of living. And humans have to figure out a way to interact and deal with them to save the galaxy. And it's a great, great story. Uh, uh, lots of different fascinating aliens in it. And then seven years later, Vinci comes out with a deepness in the sky, which occurs in an earlier point in, in uh, history, where instead of having vibratory gestalt minds, as in a fire upon the deep, what we have are very sympathetic and interesting intelligent spiders on another world. And these interesting intelligent spiders are being observed by humans. And in this novel, actually, one becomes more sympathetic with the spiders who are trying to figure out a way to advance their civilization than the humans, less sympathetic with them, who want to use the spiders for their own ends. Both these novels won the Hugo for best novel of the year. They're both great novels, but I would say A Fire Upon the Deep was uh, 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 more rich and fascinating. Um, and uh, as I said, it's one of my 25 favorite. 
uh, and uh, uh, Vinji really excels at inventiveness of alien minds in A Fire Upon the Deep and does a very good job in both of these novels of exploring possibilities of consciousness and mind with the spiders, with the tines, with humans who are in technological resonance with each other in a deepness in the sky. He delves into the topic of consciousness and mind significantly. He eventually wrote a sequel, The Children of the Sky, <coughs> to a fire upon the deep, but I didn't think it was anywhere near as good as a fire upon the deep, but I mentioned it up there. Um, he, he won another Yugo for Rainbow Zen, which, you, which I would recommend if you want to get a really rich, detailed, um, near future vision of human reality where everything is overlaid with augmented computer reality. He does a very good job of that. And in fact, he does he, the same idea comes up in Fast Times at Fairmont Heim. And uh, to sort of put the ultimate spin on our relationship with computers in the Cookie Monster, which also won a Yugo too, Rainbow Zen won a uh, Yugo and Nebula as well. And the Cookie Monster, the big discovery at the, uh, at the end of the story is that the main characters in the story realize that they're simulations in a computer, uh, even though they thought they were alive. So we have this issue that's come out today in contemporary philosophy. Are we, in fact, simulations in a computer being run by a vaster, more in intelligent being or, or species than us? Um, and this, of course, in lots of ways can tie back with the idea of the technological singularity and the whole notion of uh, uh, forms of technological intelligence, which may be superior to us. But all, when all is said and done, what I see Vinci is really good at is in the, his inventiveness with aliens and his inventiveness with a, uh, uh, a cosmic level a uh, galactic level civilization in a fire upon the deep. Now, the third one I'm gonna come to, and here we go with Jim Burns. Uh, the third one I'm gonna come to uh, writers is Greg Beer. And uh, this image up here, this painting, which is by Jim Burns, a contemporary science fiction writer, is the painting that Burns did of, um, the interior of the stone. And the stone is an object which uh, occurs in one of Greg Beer's novels, Eon. So this is the uh, cover for the novel Eon. And it's a fantastical image of what is a mind boggling reality, which we will come to when I get to that novel Eon. But Greg Beer has been a very popular science fiction writer for uh, decades, and Greg Beer has delved into a whole slew of different themes, inner space, microspace, outer space, the multiverse, the end of the world, traveling through time and evolution. Greg Beer first made a significant name for himself with his uh, Hugo and Nebula winning novella, which he eventually turned into a novel, Blood Music. And Blood Music is the story of a scientist who is able to synthesize computer circuitry with individual living cells, and in essence creates uh, unicellular cyborgs at the a single level of a cell. They become, they're cyborgs. And he creates these things, but his company doesn't want to give him credit. So what he decides to do is inject them into his own body and steal them and get out of the company. The problem is these unicellular cyborgs start to reproduce. And because they are so much more intelligent and complex than biological cells, they're able to construct macro structures and uh, multicellular um, uh, structures that are immensely more 
powerful and intelligent than our biological ecosystem. And by the end, they have covered the earth, integrated into this higher form of consciousness and ascended into outer space. It's a real trip. So <clears throat> instead of worrying about computers, we could worry about little micro uh, unicellular uh, cyborgs getting produced, merging together machine and the biological <coughs> at the uh, single cell level. And that uh, and blood music actually came out in the 1980s, but he won the Hugo and Nebula for that. And it's a very good, um, a very, very good novel, uh, a very interesting. And Greg Beer shows his understanding of biology and science, which he does through a lot of his novels to come. Um, now we'll come to Eon. And Eon comes out a couple of years later, and that's where this image is drawn from, uh, painted from. Um, near future, all of a sudden, this big asteroid materializes in outer space orbiting the moon. We go up to see what this is all about. <coughs> we go into it and find out the asteroid is hollow inside. And indeed, inside of it are ecosystems and cities, but everything is abandoned. There's nobody there. But when we start moving down through the various chambers of it, we discover there are libraries and the libraries appear to be written in English. But the problem is, for example, they find a book, Tom Sawyer, written by Samuel Clemens, but the date on it is 2100 AD. And when they come to the seventh chamber, the seventh chamber never ends. And so the asteroid is actually indeterminately bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And the mystery here is, what is this all about? Who created this? A scientist goes up there to study it, who's recruited into this process, and finds herself listed in books in the libraries in the asteroid as being responsible for the development of the theoretical physics that created this hollowed out asteroid. And the Russians and the United States, this was written during the Cold War, end up engaging in World War III while all of this is going on. Uh, I won't go any further with Eon, but Eon is uh, a very fascinating uh, 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 work in um, alternate realities. Uh, because where did it, where did the asteroid come from? And it turns out that the asteroid that's orbiting the moon is Juno, which is an asteroid in our own asteroid belt, which is still there during the ongoing saga of the um, uh, story. But Eon's a very good book. Um, and um, uh, the interior of the asteroid as envisioned here by Jim Burns is immensely complex and mind boggling. Uh, who made this thing and what is this, what is this all about? Uh, Beer wrote some other stuff during the 19, like 19, uh, late 1980s and the early 1990s, Forge of God, Tangents, Anvil of Stars, won't say anything about them, but then right around 1990, he wrote what is my favorite novel by him, and I list as one of my top 25 favorite Queen of Angels, which is only 50 years out into the future, but an intricate picture of Los Angeles around 2050, where uh, humanity has been able to use nanotechnology to either enhance oneself or not. And the, the central character in this novel is a police detective who has to solve this mystery of why a famous poet killed 15 or 20 of his friends. And they have developed Around the turn of this, around the turn of this coming century, the capacity to journey into the conscious minds of individuals using psychotechnology. So part of the story involves a bunch of minds journeying into the mind of another mind who is crazy. They go into the mind of madness and the mind of madness, the murderer that they go into is someone who has been obsessed 
and involved with voodooism. And they almost go mad inside of the consciousness of this, of this mass murderer. While all of that is going on, there is a computer attempting to figure out whether it's conscious or not. And the computer, of course, asks itself the question, how could I possibly ask the question if I am conscious, unless I am already conscious? So woven together with the diving into consciousness using technology, but a consciousness which is mad and is involved in voodooism using nanotechnology is the second story about a computer trying to figure out whether it's really aware. So it's a really, really good novel. Definitely, I think it's Greg Beer's best novel. And that's saying a lot because Greg Beer wrote lots of very good novels throughout the 80s, 90s, and up to the present. He wrote a sequel to Queen of Angels Slant. <clears throat> a couple of years later, he wrote Moving Mars, where uh, we have a future reality in which Mars is attempted to gain independence from the Earth. And we have a scientist who uh, is involved in a, a, a quantum computers and has figured out how to understand quantum reality and thus manipulate and move objects. And at the end, they have to move Mars. And so I won't tell you any more about that, but they literally move Mars. But they move Mars by merging mentally with quantum computers in order to do the complex calculations involved in order to move Mars, because the Earth's going to try to control them indefinitely, and they don't they want independence. Excellent, in, excellent depiction of New York City uh, in the coming century in moving Mars. Dinosaur Summer is an interesting book because he tells the story, what if the lost world by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle actually was true and we did bring dinosaurs back <clears throat> from uh, the uh, mountainside that occurs in uh, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, 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 lost world. Um, Darwin's Radio, excellent discussion of evolution and probably the best discussion I've seen in fictional form of how humanity would react if something superior to us were to evolve and emerge around us. If our descendants, our hominid descendants, who are better or smarter than us, come on the scene, how would we react to them? Does a really good job of explaining the next stage in human evolution and how we would react to it. Uh, that won the Nebula for best novel of the year. Um, and then he's written some other things. One that I haven't read yet uh, that came out only about five years ago, City at the End of Time, which I'm gonna order and read at some point, uh, is a story about uh, uh, a, a future reality that seems to be modeled a little bit on um, uh, Nightland, the shadow out of time, and Stapleton's last and first men all rolled into one. So sometime in the future, that's what was written in uh, the last five, six, seven years. Uh, in one of the later um, uh, webinars, I'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, that's probably a good place to take a little, for me to take a little breather. We have some other ones that, to talk about here, uh, but why don't we take a five minute break? Okay. 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 Are you set? Yep, you're all set, Tom. If everybody could just mute their mics. Thank you. Okay. All right, ahead, here we go. Tom. Here we go. There's Mars. I think that's a great picture of Mars. Kim Stanley Robinson, the fourth author, Ecological Engineering and the Utopian Dream. Um, Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson has a, uh, uh, here's a little bit of trivia, uh, a PhD in English, which he got back in the 1980s. And his um, PhD dissertation was on the novels of Philip K. Dick. Uh, it's a fascinating way for him to have started as a science fiction writer because Philip K. Dick 
was not the kind of science fiction writer that Kim Stanley Robinson turned into. Both of them very good, but uh, uh, someday I will uh, try to get a copy of that to see what Kim Stanley Robinson said about uh, Philip K. Dick. Kim Stanley Robinson is very well known up through contemporary times for his ecological science fiction. Uh, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson has a deep, intricate, fascinating interest with nature, with ecology, with the environment, and the relationship between humanity and uh, ecology and the environment. And in fact, he has continued to be a very popular science fiction writer up to the present. And I'm only going to talk about Kim Stanley Robinson during the 1990s, because later on we'll come back to him in uh, subsequent um, webinars to talk about the stuff he has written over the last 20 years, which there's been plenty. <clears throat> but at the beginning, back in the 1980s, he wrote uh, 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 three uh, early novels, uh, The Wild Shore, The Gold Coast, and Pacific Edge, which were different visions of California in the relatively near future, where the Russians had won uh, uh, the Third World War, where uh, 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 California turned into one huge Los Angeles kind of community, and then another one, Pacific Edge, where we actually had some kind of um, ecological awakening and, and our relationship with um, uh, nature. And uh, he and, and those, you know, he, he got attention for uh, early on. But what he became really famous for in the 90s, which is the next novel, I, I'm including, I, I'm turning this into one novel on, on my list. The next of, uh, of the seven of great novels of the 1990s uh, in science fiction is the Mars Trilogy, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. These three novels have been described, and I would agree, and there may be something I'm not aware of, <clears throat> the best novels ever written regarding the colonization and terraforming of Mars. They are the most intricate and comprehensive visions of how we could transform Mars from a relatively lifeless dead planet into a planet which supports human life over a period of a couple hundred years. And they are so intricate and comprehensive in their detail that they don't read like science fiction novels. You forget you're reading science fiction when you read these. <clears throat> because Kim Stanley Robinson talks about engineering. He talks about the environment of Mars. He talks about the geology of Mars. He talks about ecological transformations on the seeding of life on Mars. He talks about bringing water from underneath the surface of Mars to the surface. He talks about the people who come to Mars from the Earth to begin with and the competitions among those people for how to live on and deal with Mars, <clears throat> where a basic conflict develops between the Reds and the Greens, and the Reds want to keep Mars the way it is without life and the greens want to transform it into a, a, into a world that's alive. He talks about the politics and the economics and the social dynamics of the population of humans developing on Mars. He talks about the politics between the settlers on Mars and the earth. As the earth is going down the tubes and falling apart in various ways, Mars is flourishing of wars that occur between the Martian humans and humans on Earth until finally Mars wins its independence from the Earth. So uh, he goes through all of that and out of that intricate detail, 
multifaceted world building, he creates what is basically a realistic utopian image of 250 years roughly from now, having a new human civilization on Mars, where the Martians, in fact, due to another development, in this case here, genetics, biotechnology, were able to live a lot longer, begin to physically transform to adapt to the conditions of Mars, as well as Mars being adapted to humans. And it's a realistic, upbeat saga. Uh, as I said, it is so um, intricate and multifaceted in its description of this process that you forget you're reading science fiction. And uh, it is clearly utopian because we do eventually struggle through all the challenges and problems and debts and conflict and everything else that goes on. And he turns it into, at the same time, a social political argument for how to go about creating a better human civilization, in this case, a human civilization on Mars, than the civilization we have on the Earth. And so it's quite, quite impressive. Really great series. Um, and uh, uh, the number of different characters uh, in it are, are very interesting and diverse. Um, and um, uh, I would highly recommend it Lots of people recommend this series for uh, uh, to people who aren't familiar with science fiction, uh, uh, but just a superb piece of work, superb piece of work. And uh, Kim Stanley Robinson will continue to write stuff that has ecological themes, environmental themes, the relationship between civilization and nature up through the last 20, 30 years. But this is where he really comes into his own and does an excellent super job of describing the terraforming uh, of Mars and the creation of a new, different kind of human society based on Kim Stanley Robinson's social, political, economic views of what would be a better kind of human society, all underpinned by great physical, geological, naturalistic details about Mars and about how to change it physically and how to grow life on it and how to get water into the into the uh, surface and everything else that goes with it. With lots of disasters, lots of deaths, lots of conflicts and lots of everything else. So super piece of world building, super piece of world building. And then there's a series of stories connected with this series called The Martians, which you could buy too, uh, which are individual stories dealing with different characters and episodes during the great uh, trilogy saga. Now, here's what will take a little twist, but it's a very fascinating twist and the kinds of books I'm talking about because <clears throat> Michael Bishop, who is a science fiction writer out of uh, Georgia and a very literary science fiction writer, um, uh, wrote one of the real impressive science fiction novels of uh, the uh, 1990s. I don't know if I would put it in the top 25, but I would definitely put it in the top 50 uh, because it's very memorable and very, very inventive. Now, Bishop has been writing for quite a while in the 1970s, he wrote a really good anthropological science fiction novel about an alien species who had insect-like eyes and uh, involving a conflict uh, uh, between aliens who are mystical and those who are rational, which gets into a very good discussion about uh, purposeful evolution and how we should come at our own purposeful evolution, a funeral for the eyes of fire. Very good. Uh, and, and I think that was his first novel from the 70s. In the 80s, he won the Nebula for Best Science Fiction Novel of the Year for No Enemy But Time. And No Enemy But Time involves a man who has dreams about the distant past, connects up with a physicist who invents a time machine, and the man goes back 2 million years to into the past in Africa 
and observes, interacts, and eventually even mates with <clears throat> a homo habilis. <clears throat> and it's a really good description of what life would be like for our primitive hominid ancestors. And it has a very fascinating twist to it at the end, a very interesting twist, because though the man thinks he is having dreams and visions about the past, he really is having dreams or visions about the future. I won't tell you any more than that, but a very good novel. And Bishop is uh, 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 clearly in the uh, uh, tradition of uh, having a strong literary uh, uh, dimension to his writing, uh, a very, very good writer. But then he, in the 1990s, which is what we're talking about today, he wrote his best piece of work, uh, in my opinion. And I think most people would say this too. Um, uh, he wrote Brittle Innings. Now, can you make a very good science fiction novel based upon baseball? And that's what he did in this. Indeed, not only is it about baseball, it's about baseball in the deep South, which is raci racist, prejudicial, and nasty in the 1940s. And the real inventive thing is in the context of this novel, he retells the story of Frankenstein. Because the central character in the novel who plays shortstop for a minor league baseball team in Georgia ends up having to room with the biggest and ugliest man he has ever seen, who is their top home run hitter for this minor league baseball team. And this ugly massive human sits around all day long when he's not playing baseball, reading philosophical and highly intellectual books. And as becomes revealed through the story, his roommate, the big home run hitter, this ugly man whose skin doesn't quite fit on his body right, is the creature from Frankenstein's, from, this, from the novel Frankenstein. And indeed, the whole story of Frankenstein is retold because in the context of this novel, the story was not fiction and the story was not written by Mary Shelley. The story was actually true and it was based upon the notes that the creature put together and eventually got to Mary Shelley and she put it into a book. And so on this baseball team in the 20th century is the creature from Shelley's early 19th century novel, In the Flesh. And it's a very interesting book. Um, it has lots of fascinating twists. There's lots of um, uh, excellent uh, depictions of the culture, the mentality of the of the of uh, the 1940s, and at the same time, there's this really strange thing, which is Frankenstein's monster playing baseball. And it works. It just literally works. The whole thing works. And it's actually been referred to as <coughs> a candidate for the great American novel. Um, and it's a convincing retelling of the story of Frankenstein. Actually, I found the retelling more interesting than the original Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And the, uh, in, in the end, you have great sympathy for both the creature and for uh, 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 the central character who's playing shortstop. And even if you don't like baseball, I would read it. I would definitely read it. It's not world building, but it is very inventive. And it is an experiment in alternate reality of a strange kind. 
<clears throat> because in this case here, the alternate reality is that something we thought was fiction actually turns out to be not fiction, but true. And if that, indeed that is the case, what would this be? In this case here, Frankenstein playing baseball. Uh, I know that sounds ludicrous, but it just works. He's very good at it, very good at pulling this off. So that's one of the great novels of the 1990s, and I have to mention it, um, uh, and uh, um, I, I would recommend it uh, as, uh, you know, Bishop's best piece of work and uh, uh, very moving, very good ending, very surprised ending to the whole thing. And uh, it's a story about finding one's soul or finding one's personhood. Uh, and uh, of the um, uh, 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 mentality of the United States, at least in the South, in the mid uh, uh, century, during World War II. Oh, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt is in it. Okay, now I'll come to the last two characters here, the last two writers. Uh, and in some ways, perhaps they are the most cosmic and intellectually high powered of the seven. And first we'll, first we'll do Greg Egan. Uh, human evolution, cosmic consciousness, science, scientific thought experiments, and the hardest science fiction novel ever written. All right. Now, you know the word hard science fiction can be used to refer to a science fiction novel based on hard science, like physics and chemistry, et cetera. Okay. But hardest could also mean the most difficult. And in this case here, Greg Egan has the uh, um, uh, notoriety or, or honor of having written what lots of people call the most difficult science fiction novel ever written to read, okay? Uh, and we will come to that in a moment. Notice I do not have a picture of Greg Egan up there. Greg Egan is from Australia and there are no pictures of him and it is noted there are no pictures of him on the web. So as far as I know, nobody knows what Greg Egan looks like. For all we know, Greg Egan could be a woman. Okay, I don't know if that's true, but Greg Egan definitely has a background in mathematics and in physics, and it shows through in his novels. And I mean to say, he is really, really high powered math science. <clears throat> he made his name in the early 90s with Permutation City. And Permutation City involves a relatively near future where a scientist has created a immersive virtual reality using computers of sufficient power that one can download one's mind into the computer and enter into the virtual reality created by that computer. So this is post-singularity. The computer has obviously got sufficient processing power to move, uh, to, to allow a conscious mind to go into it. We have a second scientist who has created an artificial life simulation program and created an artificial life program where the artificial life in the program evolved. And the artificial life program is moved into the computer program, the computer, and the scientists involved have moved virtually into the computers as well, too. And the scientist has developed a program that he believes in this computer will uh, 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 let me see embody indeterminately evolving complexity and he comes up with this theory that any sufficiently complex mind will be able to indeterminately 
keep evolving using as hardware the total expanse and population of particles in the universe. Now, we'll try that again. That is, he presents this theory, Greg Egan does, and he's a scientist now, who says once this conscious mind, conscious reality gets going, it will be able to keep expanding itself because it will use whatever material exists throughout the entire universe to run its program. And in this virtual reality, the virtual life that's in the virtual reality begins to evolve and becomes intelligent very fast and begins to try to figure out who created it. So in the virtual reality, we have another virtual reality that's trying to decide how it came into being and the humans who are in virtual reality attempt to explain to it that we made you, but they won't believe it. <clears throat> so Greg Egan in the story considers the question of how do I understand the nature of the universe and the nature of the relationship between consciousness, mind and the universe, and to top it all off, the beings who are the virtual beings evolving in this virtual universe are upsetting the virtual universe. So it would be like if God created the universe and the universe someday decided that it was going to unsettle the nature of God, which is in fact what happens in this. And what Greg Egan continuously does through his novels as a scientist, and as a mathematician, is he engages in scientific thought experiments. He starts scientifically theorizing. And this when he theorizes about how can you possibly have an indeterminately expanding conscious mind running on the universe as its hardware. And what that happened. And how can something that gets created by the creator end up usurping the power of the creator. <coughs> That's permutation city in a nutshell. Then a few years later, he wrote Diaspora. And Diaspora takes place in the distant future. Humanity is divided into three different species, totally virtual minds, robotic bodies, and natural humans. The beginning of diaspora <coughs> is a real challenge to read because Greg Egan attempts to describe how a virtual conscious mind could self-organize within a computer-supported virtual reality. He attempts to describe to you the birth of a virtual mind without it even having a biological body to begin with. And this virtual mind is concerned with understanding the cosmos and the virtual mind discovers that there's something wrong in its predictions based upon its present theory of reality because something takes places that it can't understand or predict. And it goes on this uh, journey through higher levels of reality in order to figure out what's wrong in its present understanding of the universe. And while this is going on, because there was something wrong in its predictions, the robotic and the biological forms of life are severely threatened. And I'm gonna give you a spoiler. In the end, all that's left are the virtual humans. And the argument in here is that the virtual conscious mind embodied in some kind of substrate is a more adapted and uh, capable form of conscious existence than either the biological or the robotic. And I often put diaspora up when I compare visions of the future evolution of humans and I compare it with uh, what happens in the time machine with 
Wells is Morlock and Eloy, what happens in Stapleton with Last and First Men, <clears throat> then the next jump forward in terms of science, scientific technological sophistication is diaspora. And what happens to the future of human consciousness in diaspora, informed by Greg Egan and his understanding of contemporary computer technology and, uh, and, and uh, 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 contemporary physics. But Greg Egan again invents, theoretically invents new science to come up with the plots for his stories. He thinks things out. Um, Oceanic, he won the um, uh, Yugo for, and it's an interesting short story in which people who think they're having religious experiences are actually just simply being influenced by the bacteria in the ocean that they live in. And Greg Egan is very secular scientific, and this is kind of an undercut to people who think they have religious mystical experiences, and he trucks it up to simple chemistry. But then we come to what's considered the hardest science fiction novel ever written, Shield's Ladder. And Shield's Ladder takes place in the distant future involving an experiment on a distant star system to test out a nuance in the scientific theory of the universe that humans have developed by, I think it's 20,000 AD, and something goes wrong in the experiment, and this tiny little vacuum begins to expand outward, and at, a, at half the speed of light, sucking everything into it around it. And it would seem to indicate that there was something fundamentally wrong with our theory of the universe. And the theory of the universe we have in the future is a theory that integrates together quantum physics and the theory of relativity. So there's something wrong with our theory of the universe because this thing is growing and growing and growing. And then we jump ahead 600 years and the thing now is sucked in all of these different star systems. And there's this group of uh, humans who, some of whom are corporeal and some of whom are not, are trying to test out and penetrate into this giant bubble that's growing. Okay, now this is, uh, as they say, the hardest science fiction novel ever written. And they can't seem to make any sense of it because as it becomes apparent, our universe and our understanding of our universe is only a special case of what is actually a much more fundamental and free and open reality existing down another level below quantum reality. And so we do not have the mindset or uh, the ontological support for understanding the deepest level of reality, which is way beyond our own. Eventually, though, two characters, uh, not, excuse me, it wasn't two characters, a bunch of characters figure out how to penetrate in. In order to do, though, they have to go in as a virtual wave, and what they find inside is a universe that is infinitely more complicated than our own. And, and their journey takes less than one microsecond in order to penetrate into it and begin to communicate with these much more complex beings down below at a level that we at our level could never possibly comprehend. And it's done very well. And at the end of it, it reminded me of uh, Abraham Merritt's The Metal Monster. What if you encountered some form of existence of mentality that was at a level of complexity that created a universe that was difficult to just simply even see? Uh, but uh, a Schill's Ladder, you can't get through it. Again, uh, Greg Egan tries to invent physics as he goes along uh, and invents a different kind of physics. Um, but I still think Deaspa is probably better. Uh, and then recently, a little more recently, he actually won an award uh, for his um, uh, uh, novel, um, excuse me. 
Oops. Um, <clears throat> yes, where is that? I'm trying to find that novel, that last one, which is the one I didn't get to read yet. Okay. Oh, yeah. Terranicia. Okay. Uh, but sometime in the near future, we'll read that. Okay. Now we're going to come to the last person of my seven. Uh, and uh, the last person of the seven is Stephen Baxter. Uh, Stephen Baxter is a contemporary science fiction writer with a background in astronomy and physics, but is very literary at the same time. And um, uh, uh, Stephen Baxter has the honor of being the one author who has two novels of on my best 25 all-time science fiction novels, two, as opposed to just one. The thing he became famous for to begin with was the cosmic odyssey of the Zeely and the Fotina birds, a war as long as the universe. He started writing toward the tail end of the 1980s. And the first story he published was called The Zeely Flower. Now, Zeely notice is spelled X E E L E E. And the Zeely Flower starts off the short story with a guy who's running a tourist stop on the moon Miranda, which orbits Saturn. And when the tourists come to the moon, to, to, to his tourist shop, they always ask him why he's using a fishbowl as his toilet. That's how it begins, this incredible saga. And his response is, my bosses used to live in that fishbowl. What the hell does that even mean? Okay, his bosses were goldfish or something? Well, his bosses were the squeam. And the squeam were this alien life form that conquered the earth in about 4000 AD. That's how this whole saga begins. In the 1990s, he wrote a series of novels that blossomed off of that little short story called Wrath, Flux, uh, Time Like Infinity, and Ring. And these novels ended up chronicling a multi-billion year history of the universe where the fundamental drama of the entire history of the universe was this struggle or battle between the forces of matter, which reached their evolutionary zenith, and the zeely, not humans, the zeely, and the forces of dark matter, who reached their evolutionary zenith in Fotina birds. Now, this saga takes place over a period of billions of years. Humans are in it. In fact, humans are a lot of the major characters. But in the end, humans are small potatoes compared to the Zeely and the Fotina birds. The Zeely live in the centers of black holes. The Fotina birds live within stars. And as dark matter, they are attempting to convert the stars within our universe into white dwarfs which they find much more hospitable than our big burning red giants or yellow kind of stars. And the Zeely are time travelers. And so the Zeely have foreseen that the forces of dark matter are eventually going to conquer the universe. So they go back in time to the beginnings of the universe and start to create a gigantic ring which is going to provide a portal to escape out of this universe into another universe. Through all of this, humans come on the scene, begin to evolve, get conquered by, first of all, the squeam, 
then they rebel against the scream and break free, get conquered by the quacks who move through time, then go to war with the silver ghosts who are building a computer that's going to um, compute the entire history of the universe, and then finally go to war with the Zeli. And in 1 million years AD, they are squashed finally by the Zeli and are put in a kind of contained environment and only one of them at the end watches the end of the universe which gets chronicled by the computer who the silver ghost has created to chronicle the entire history of the universe this is an immensely intricate story there are 16 volumes in this history of the universe the zeli and the photina birds <clears throat> the best one to read <clears throat> is after he did these four, he attempted to do one novel in which he would compress the entire history, and that was Vacuum Diagrams. And Vacuum Diagrams is the most cosmic of the seven that I've mentioned so far, uh, the six I've mentioned so far, because its background is the entire history of the universe, from the beginning until the Zeli leave at the end. Um, and uh, I would definitely recommend reading it uh, to get a picture of somebody who attempts to create a history of the, of the universe from the beginning to the end, but populates it with characters, populates it with drama, puts humanity into it, but in the end, humanity is not that significant compared to the two most powerful forms of intelligence, the Zeli and Fotina birds who fight it out through our entire cosmic history. So definitely recommend that as one of the best science fiction novels of the 1990s, Vacuum Diagrams. Vacuum Diagrams comes from uh, uh, Feynman's, uh, the mathematician, physicist Feynman's idea of vacuum diagrams which are within uh, the uh, context of a vacuum, one could have a mathematical development and then reversal of that development, which amounts to nothing. So we are diagrams in a vacuum, literally. That is, we're events that go backwards and forwards in the context of nothing. Uh, which is part of the saga that goes on in there. And remember, the whole thing is getting narrated by God who gets invented by the silver ghosts. Okay. But to me, that was not Baxter's uh, uh, best work, which I'll come to in a moment. But here's just some of his other novels in the series. He just kept writing these. You know, he wrote those back in the 90s. Then he wrote more, part of the uh, saga of the Zeli and the Fotina birds, uh, Exultant. Coalescent about hive minds, transcendent, which is like um, a, a takeoff on last and first men, where humans in the future attempt to relive the experiences of all of humanity. Um, and then in the Zeli uh, redemption uh, uh, and uh, vengeance, uh, the Zeli decide they're going to rewrite history again, but not rewrite humanity out of it um, because humanity was a nuisance. Um, and so this is still ongoing. According to one website, there's 16 volumes in this story at this point in time. Uh, and, uh, and the Zeli always stay rather enigmatic. There's an image of a Zeli or a Zeli ship. Uh, and the Fotina birds stay very enigmatic and what they look like. Okay, but I think Stephen Baxter's Beck's book was of this period was the time ships and i have this in the top 10 best science fiction novels ever stephen baxter was commissioned by the wells society to write a sequel to the time machine which he did the time ships and the time ships begins right when the time machine ends the time traveler has come back to 19th century england and decides he's going to go back in the time machine go back to the future and save Weena, the Eloy uh, who dies 
uh, the woman uh, in the first, in the novel, The Time Machine. He gets in the time machine, he starts going back into the future. By the time he gets up to 600,000 AD, he notices it doesn't look the same way that it did the first time he went out into the future. It's all dark. And he stops and he's in the inside of what appears to be like a Dyson sphere. And he gets captured by intelligent Morlock. Now the Morlock were beasts in the time machine. When he goes back out again, they're not beasts anymore, but they're very sophisticated, intelligent, and they're not nasty. And as it turns out, when he went back in the time machine, told the story to his friends, the time machine got published and changed history. So here we have fiction changing history. So when he goes back out again, history is not, uh, the future is not the same as before. And so he decides that he's going to go back in time in the time machine to when he's a young man and tell himself not to make the time machine because he's got to find a way back to Wiener, who lives in the future. But when he goes back to the 1870s, when he's a young man and tells his younger self not to make the time machine, all of a sudden, Germans appear on the scene from the 1940s and take him off and abscond him from uh, the 1870s. Now, the Germans in 1940 are still fighting World War I and have time travel because he's starting to upset all of history. So he takes off again and he goes back two million years and the Germans follow him back there. When all is said and done, he bops around through time, continually altering time, has his companion, a very intelligent, sophisticated Morlock, <coughs> and they eventually build with a set of uh, uh, universal constructor machines, a series of time ships that are gonna go back to the beginning of the universe and look for a more interesting and fascinating universe than the one we presently exist in. But then he goes back to, 1870, and he gives himself the secret to how to create the time machine, which of course he creates. So we end up in a loop. It's a really great novel, very intricate, very uh, metaphysical, and Baxter pulls it off. And I think that was his best novel that he has written so far. He's written lots of other stuff, the Manifold Trilogy, which uh, came out early in the uh, beginning of uh, the uh, decade, uh, not the decade, the millennium. He wrote a really great kind of bird's eye view of the history of evolution from the dinosaurs into the future evolution, really good discussion of evolution and the evolution of intelligence and consciousness. This came out around 2000 as well too, another really good book. And then a few years ago, he wrote The Massacre of Mankind, which is a sequel to The War of the Worlds. And I don't think The Massacre of Mankind is as good a sequel as The Time Ships, but indeed it is inventive in that he assumes at the beginning that the Martians did invade the Earth, and that changed all of our history. <clears throat> and so now we're in a <clears throat> 20th century, which is different than the 20th century that we had been in because the Martians invaded us and we're getting ready to fight them again and they come back. And with another interesting twist at the end. But the time ships to me seemed like a better <clears throat> uh, universe building, imaginative, cosmic, mind, spend, uh, mind expanding book than uh, uh, the, the Massacre of Mankind. And I think of it as being his best. Okay, so. That's the end for today. I went over by 10 minutes. Next time, uh, just quickly, we're going to talk about, oops, uh, excuse me. I goofed. Yeah. Next time, we're going to talk about women science fiction writers in the 1990s, Lois uh, McMaster Bujold and Octavia, Octavia Butler, Nancy Kress, Sherry Tepler. I'm going to talk a lot about steampunk and alternative histories and realities. 
uh, and Jetter powers Blaylock and the Difference Engine, science fiction movies, including The Matrix, science fiction on TV in the 90s. And then what Time Magazine says is one of the top 20 greatest novel, English speaking novels of the 20th century, a comic book. Watchmen, just a big comic book. Uh, and that's what we'll end for, uh, on next time. So anyway, we'll stop right there. I'm going to uh, pause sharing, stop sharing, right?